Um, just to get a bit of a show of hands, who here is plant, uh, growing in their garden? Can you put your hand up? Three, four, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and who's got an allotment? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so a um, bit of a mixture. There are different challenges with allotments and um, gardens. Um, so yeah, um, essentially gardens tend to have more cats and slugs and allotments maybe have a few more birds or badgers or rabbits. So, I mean, that's the main difference really, I suppose. Um, okay, so let's get going. I'm gonna share my screen. Go for gardening talks. There we go, and play. Lovely, so hopefully you can see my cursor. Oh, I've gone right back to the beginning, hold on. That's because I started thinking about changing the end. There we go. Right, so we're gonna cover um, things in a really obvious order. So we're gonna start off with things that can be grown indoors to start with and then planted out. And then we're gonna talk about the things that have to be sown directly into the soil. Um, and then talking about tender vegetables that need to be protected from the frost um, and then perennials fruit and flowers at the end. Um, so first of all um, at this time of year we're still going to be getting a few frosts and the soil has started to warm up so you can start planting things in the soil but it's really good to start getting things planted in inside in the greenhouse or polytunnel. Um, so you can start things off on your windowsill indoors, or you can use a cloche, um, a cold frame, or a greenhouse or a polytunnel. So has anybody not got anywhere under cover that they, do they, are they completely struggling to mm -hmm. find anywhere under cover? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so you, you've not got much then, Sean. And, um, so have you got some windowsills that have some sunlight? Yeah, okay. Um, so first things are leeks. Now I've just gone for these because they were first in my notes. Um, but actually you can grow them inside or outside to start with. So you can start them off in a tray and you can buy leeks from the garden centre. Um, but I do find that they are better off if grown in the ground. They tend to get bigger. Um, but at this time of year, they do need some protection. Um, they're not likely to grow that well um, just on the soil. So I've put a bit of fleece over these. Um, that's a little white mound or whitish mound there is a piece of horticultural fleece. So if you haven't got a windowsill then that's a way of protecting them. And you can also get glass cloches and plastic cloches as well. Um, but if you, the way that you sow leeks is I actually start with about a square foot, create a bit of a dip, dip in the soil with my trowel. So I'm gonna go through this and I'm gonna say it a million times, you will remember, so you water it first. So many people think that you're gonna water things afterwards all the time, but if you water it first, then you've got all these little tiny seeds, that's a whole packet of seeds there. Um, and I'm going to um, sprinkle some soil. So just get a piece of soil and just sprinkle it over the top. That gives a nice fine layer. I was once told a nice rule of thumb is cover the seed in the thickness that the seed is. So if you've got a big seed, you put more soil on top. If you've got a little seed, just put a little bit on top. Um, and actually that's quite a good rule of thumb. So just sprinkle a bit of seed on the top, pat it down with your flat hand, and then all the water that was underneath will soak up. So you don't need to water it again. And if you put some fleece on it, you might not need to water it again for some time. I planted mine a couple of weeks ago and I haven't watered them again. I mean, it has rained, but. Oh, why can't I get out? There we go. Um, so when they start coming up, they're gonna be like little pieces of grass, um, like bent over little, little things. You can see in this right hand picture, they're quite cute actually when they first come up. So the first time you weed this, you need to be really careful. You can see there's a little weed here. So just pick them out with your fingers and make sure that you do weed it at least once um, at the beginning, otherwise they'll all get swamped. And you're looking to get um, essentially spring onion type um, plants. In fact, the one on the right is spring onions, but they look so similar. I've used that picture because I didn't have a picture of my leeks. Um, and you're looking at planting them when they get, ideally it'd be lovely if they were a pencil thickness. 
that doesn't always happen. They don't always grow that well. So if you um, just, you dig a hole in the ground, give, give it a little wiggle. I do the no dig method and this ground has not been turned over. And you can just push, a th uh, we actually have an iron bar. You can see at the top there where my cursor is, that's just an iron bar. So it is quite heavy, but you can just dip something in the ground. Some people have little hand dibbers that are wooden, um, but you're essentially looking at making a hole, putting the leek plant in, and then watering it. Now you don't have to fill the hole up with soil. If you do that, you'll get more soil in your leeks. And the action of just watering it will put enough soil on the roots so they'll be fine. Um, and that is literally it, other than maybe weeding it once. Um, so leeks, I would say, are high yielding, pretty easy. Um, the only disease really that, well, they get the same diseases as onions, so they get mildew and rust if it's really wet. So if there's a really wet year, then they'll be more difficult. Um, but I mean, we haven't had that problem since 2012, really, when it rained all summer. If you do have really, really tiny leeks and they are just a little wisp of grass and they're not doing anything and it's already June, because we're looking at, if you're sowing them now, we're probably looking at planting them out in May, then there is a trick that you can do. So you can dig a trench, so plant them at the bottom of the trench and then earth them up. Um, but that's obviously not the no dig method and it's better if you can get a bigger leak. But if you're struggling, then that's a good way of doing it. So that's leeks. Now leek moth is a little um, moth that buries its way into the, into the leek. And the only way of really protecting it organically is covering it in horticultural fleece. Now I found that this was a problem about 10 years ago and I haven't had it since. So has anybody grown leeks before and experienced leek moth? It was essentially a form yeah, all moment. the time. <laughs> You get it all the time. Yeah, at the allotment. Right. Mm. Okay, because I I heard it was a foreign invader from um, Europe. It flew over because it was a bit warmer, and I don't know. I just haven't really had a problem with it since. Um, I don't know why. I mean, they should overwinter in other people's leeks, but then I always have my leeks overwintering, so they're not coming from somewhere else. Where's your allotment, Jane? Was that you said? Oh yeah, with Liscombe. Right, mm. and it's not anywhere in particular like it's not in a walled garden or anything like that no it? no it's quite a windy site as well so mm. it's 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 very annoying mm. i mean we have the the year couple of years that we did have it we grew it under fleece relatively successfully um and we just um we actually had like a, a yeah hoops very similar to that but a bit bigger um because that's you can see the carrots on the side they're actually smaller hoops so you, with leeks you need them about uh how big is that foot and a half off the ground um but i mean i think if you're the first time growing leeks especially if you're in wellington i'd just see if you get it first before worrying about it mm -hmm. and if you get it then obviously do it next year they do you find jane that they get every single leak or is it just the odd few um not everyone, but quite a lot. Okay. It, it is predominant throughout the site. Everybody gets it. So it, we, we just pass it around, you know. Yeah, I wonder with it, if it's a good idea one year to say, right, can everybody on site harvest their leeks by Christmas? <laughs> and that might, you might have a little population going on just on your site. Um, yes, yeah, so I really wanted to get those um, traps to, to you trap the male moths I think okay. and, and stop them breeding but that that's yet to happen we're just covering it with fleece so um, or vira mesh. Helen uh, yeah. we've got Chris and Simon who are having yeah. problems with rust lots of rust. Yeah well I don't find rust is too much of a worry if you have it then as long as it's not masses it's not really going to affect your crop that much um, it tends to be if it's wet. Um, does, is it a little bit of rust or is it all over the plant? A lot. It's, all, it's everywhere. Right. Yeah, I mean, it ruins the leaks on mine and just become, become unusable. 
Right. I mean, we've had it before, but it's never really been that bad. You can nip it off. If you see a little bit to start with, just take off those leaves. Um, it's, um, uh, is, it fun is it fungal or a virus? I think it's fungal. Um, so it carries in both le um, rust and mildew, uh, um, both airborne. So they tend to, it's not really a lot you can do about it, apart from take a little bit off when it starts, because then it will infect the rest of the plants. Um, but I think possibly one of the reasons why I don't seem to be too bad with it, it might be because I'm choosing a variety that's rust resistant. So I've been choosing muscle bra. I know it's like really bog standard, um, old fashioned type of leek, but it's really good. Um, and the, leaf, uh, the seed's really cheap as well. So we've been using muscle bra. And also our soil after 16 years of putting manure and compost on is really good. And generally plants that are suffering from um, a disease, um, sometimes it's the soil hasn't got enough food in it. So if you um, make sure that you're, soil is really nutritious and really healthy it will grow plants that are healthy enough to withstand um some diseases um so i don't know if that helps so maybe more manure and compost <laughs> okay so is everybody all right about leaks have we got any other questions okay so broad beans um, broad beans i've always started off in pots just because any that i've put in the ground have been eaten by mice but we did have a really good tip last time of if you do want to sow things in the ground in a drill, you can put holly leaves in the drill and it stops the mice eating them. So I thought that was amazing. I might even try it next year. Um, but I quite like growing stubby plants. And I would imagine that most people's broad beans will be in by now. I did cover it in the last talk. Um, or at least you're thinking about getting them in. Um, if not, don't worry, because um, I, my husband's gran really liked broad beans and she can um uh consistently sowed them all the way through the year to get continuation all through the year so you can sow and grow broad beans all through the year it's just that they generally are started early because of black fly um <clears throat> so they can be quite leggy plants unless you choose a dwarf variety so you need something to prop them up um here are some of the um examples of um, how people have tied them up. So there's some string and canes here. Um, and you can see the guy on the right of the picture, how tall they are. Now this is black fly, you tend to get it in May. Um, and the way to stop it is um, to pick, it tends to attack the top of the plant. So you pick off the shoots and you can eat the shoots as well. So obviously soak it in water. Um, and wash off all the black fly, but the tops are really tasty. Um, so one of the things I've found that's really helpful for black fly is keeping a really good population of ladybirds. Now we've planted a, he a flowering hedge and kind of accidentally, I planted a, a viburnum, which is called snowball bush. It's in Sarah Raven's catalog. And it's like big pom-pom white flowers. And I got these flowers for cutting and I never cut them because they're always covered in black fly. And I've since learned that that's a really good way of protecting your food crops against black fly is actually having another plant that you're not going to eat that is really black fly really attracted to. Um, and because it grows a population of black fly early on, you get a really good population of ladybirds. And then if you can find um, uh, leave things for the ladybirds to overwinter in, um, like some uh, seed heads and things in the allotment, then the ladybirds will be ready to get your black fly on your beans. So that's, um, I'd say, a good tip for organic growing. So any questions about broad beans? No? All good? Right, let's move on then. Uh, so peas and mange too. Um, I did cover these a little bit in the last talk as well. Now these things here are root trainers. I really like root trainers because they help you grow plants when they don't like their roots being disturbed. And peas don't really like their roots being disturbed, but you can open these up and plant them really nicely without um, causing them too much trauma. And I tend to do an early crop indoors and then plant them out and protect them with a bit of fleece 
because even though they're hardy in the cold, I'm really bad at hardening things off. Now, if you're, if you're a beginner, hardening things off is where you have the plants originally grown in a greenhouse and then you put them outside. And because they've gone from somewhere really nice and warm to outside and it's probably quite cold, then they get a bit of shock and they don't grow very well for a bit. And what you're supposed to do is gradually bring them outside and maybe have a cold frame that gives a bit of protection. Now, I don't have a cold frame and I tend to be a bit rushed. So I found a bit of a cheat of doing this is instead of hardening off, I just chuck a bit of fleece over it for a bit. And then that, <laughs> that's essentially a, um, a cheat's way of hardening things off. So as you can tell, I do use fleece quite a lot. I think it's one of the um, uh, saviors of um, organic growing. And um, they have apparently invented one that hasn't got plastic in it that's made from sheep's wool. So I will be looking for that. So um, I tend to do two or three sowings of peas to get a continual harvest. So, sorry, the first lot is in pots. And on the top right picture there, the ones on the left are the ones that I grew in pots early um, in February. And the ones in the right on the right are the ones that I sowed seed. And you can see that they're way behind the first lot. Um, when you sow them in the ground, um, I would probably do that end of March then or maybe April even give it a month in between your two um, sowings um, you just put them in a drill about an inch apart it doesn't need to be any thicker than that apparently it doesn't actually give you any more yield if you have them closer than six inches um, according to Joy Larkin so um, I find about an inch apart is good for any that don't grow and um, just gives you a bit of backup plan um, and then you get a continual crop, which is lovely, isn't it? I mean, we don't want to have everything at once. Um, it's nice to spread it out. And you just need to give peas something to climb up. Um, pigeons. Yes, Anita. Sorry, you? we've got a few questions here. Um, Chris has had terrible years with peas. Uh, he's not having a good time, Chris, <laughs> being eaten. And he still hasn't worked out by what? Chicken mesh cloche on a simple wooden frame seems to have worked last year, so it might have been the birds. Um, Peter um, is asking, do you lay the fleece directly onto the crop or raise it on hoops? And Andreas is asking, what's the name of the flower that attracts black fly? Um, I can't remember what, this, what the proper word is, but it's a type of viburnum and it's called snowball bush. And if you type viburnum and snowball bush into Google, it will come up. Um, and it's, it's good for cut flowers. And Sarah Raven says it's one of her favorites, although she says everything's her favorite. Um, so fleece, um, if I go back to this picture, now this is my method um, and the other things are taken off the internet. So we've done various things over the time. I've got this bit of these bits of wire fencing, I think they are. They're, they're just perfect because they're about a metre tall. And I put canes either side of them so they don't fall over. And I don't even need to tie them up with anything. It's, they're really quite perfect for peas. Um, and I just, uh, when they're, if, if they're in the ground, I'll actually lay the fleece on the ground. And it does help everything to germinate better if you just lay a bit of fleece over the top of it when it's germinating on, on the ground. But when I'm planting them next to this fence, I drape it over the top like a tent. And then I use clothes pegs to attach it to the wire. And um, basically I collect long, heavy things. Sounds completely insane, doesn't it? But if I find like a bit of scaffold pole that somebody's throwing out or like those um there's all sorts of long things that you find at the dump isn't there and, and um recycling but if you if you find anything long and heavy and you don't want to throw it away then keep it for your veg patch um and i'm trying to remember what the other question was what's eating your peas so i find with these little fences that pigeons sit on the fence and they eat the top of the peas i don't find that they're like either clever or not lazy enough to actually go down on the floor and eat them 
So I find that I don't really need to protect against the pigeons, just I think because they've had enough just picking them off the top. Um, it's some varieties grow really quite tall and it's annoying if the pigeons pick them, but it's also really difficult to net things high up unless you've got a fruit cage, because the higher it goes, the more likely it's gonna blow down and it's a bit of a pain. So I think if you found netting worked, it will probably have been pigeons. Um, I find that mice eat the peas a little bit, but I don't find the mice eat so many that I miss them. And I sometimes find under my compost bin, like a little mouse nest and like little pea shells. I just think it's really cute. So I let them have some. I even found one in the polytunnel when I had peas in the polytunnel. I just thought that was so cute. Um, but then that's my sentimentality. I just figure if there's enough for me, then I can give some to a mouse. I think I might, might feel a bit different if there was loads of rats eating things. I have had a rat eating my sweet corn in broad daylight before, which I felt a bit was cheeky. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I've done that and I answer the questions. Okay, so um, so they're all quite big seeds, weren't they? The ones that I was just covering, uh, apart from the leeks, I suppose. Um, but sowing small seeds, um, I have recently discovered trays, recently as in the last couple of years, um, I always used to sow seeds in modules and then thin them out. And it's actually less fiddly to sow it in a tray and then prick them out and put them into modules. Um, because I was always a bit like, oh, I'll share out the seedlings. And then you're taking them out of a module and then sharing them out. So I'll just, just a little quick tip for um, saving a bit of time. Um, so I just do little rows with my finger um, in the trays. So different things, make sure you label them. Um, and I think that the biggest tip that I've got for um, beginners is the speed in which you prick out and move on your seedlings. And it gives you the mo most success in the size of your plants mm. because the, the plants will run out of food really quite quickly and then stop growing. Um, so I've always found that the main problems with me moving things on is work and being too busy and you're looking at something going, oh, I really need to move that on. And it's been two weeks now and I've still not got around to it. Um, but yeah, out of everything, then that's um, a good thing to make time for um, is just moving on your seedlings a bit quicker. Um, and so you want to grow nice. Nice, healthy individual plants will survive a lot better than little seedlings. If you plant out a healthy plant, it's much less likely to get eaten by slugs for some reason, or at least it's less likely to completely die if a slug nibbles on it. Um, and so planting out uh, seedlings, again, you've got the water the ground first. So I've dug these holes where you can see my cursor is, and then water fill up the hole and then let it drain away. And it just saves you watering. And then I, I have watered them again once they're in because they're not gonna wash away like seeds, but you can see how wet the soil is. And that will stay wet for a little while and really get them off to a good start. Um, and you can just see that because um, it, I can't remember what exactly time of year it was. I think it was quite early last year that I put that those lettuce out. Um, it was still quite cold, so I did my trick of putting the fleece on instead of hardening them off, but then took the fleece off reasonably soon, and you can just see them growing. And bottom right is, um, I just think it's a beautiful lettuce. It's called Interred um, Cos, if you're interested. Um, and it looks slightly strange being so dark red, but it, it's lovely in the bowl. Um, so that's essentially the method that you do for all of your seedlings. Um, I also like root uh, mycorrhizal root grow powder, which is a uh, powdered fungi, and I'll scatter a little bit on the on the roots as I'm planting out. Um, now, somebody I don't know whether um, Naeem has uh, managed to make it today, but somebody uh, she asked me yesterday um, about the no dig method, and I was having a think because everybody talks about the no dig method as being cardboard and mulch. Now, it's not just about that. Um, it's essentially, the main point is not digging. And um, there are kind of purest ways of doing it and sort of 
halfway there's of doing it that's still fine now as long as you're not actually putting a spade in and turning over the soil for kind of no reason then you're doing no dig so you don't have to do cardboard and mulch to do it the reason why you do cardboard and mulch is because you might have weeds on the surface or grass on the surface at the moment and you don't want to dig it out which is valid so it's a really good way of suppressing weeds but if you've got an allotment already you've got a garden already and the soil hasn't got a lot of weeds on you don't have to put the cotton pots and the cardboard on what that does is it essentially slows down the growth of weeds around the plants but i really i was thinking why don't i do this more and it's actually because it's a bit fiddly when you're doing things in a grid system to put cardboard round. It's to, they're too close together. And I quite like it when I get little self-sown, these are poppies, wild poppies. And I have like little plant bulbs in between things. So I think that's probably the main reason why I don't do it that much is just that it can be a bit fiddly. And if it's not totally necessary, then why do it? Um, but if you're starting from scratch and you've got a weedy site and you don't want to actually turn the soil over to weed it because there is a point of actually keeping the nutrients at the roots, then that's when the cardboard um, comes into play. So I hope that um, explains things a little bit. There's uh, quite a lot of different summer mulches that you can do to suppress weeds. That's one of them. Um, the cardboard and uh, compost is a grow through mulch, which only works with seedlings like this. It doesn't work if you sow it directly in the soil. Um, but there are other ways of protecting the soil and covering the ground that we're going to cover in the next talk. Um, just because I've been going on about that, is there any questions about no dig or what I've just said about cardboard? Okay. Um, Right, so uh, celery. Celery needs warmth to germinate. So I did say in the last talk that you can, can sow it indoors on your windowsill um, and or you can use a heated propagator or just wait until it's a bit warmer to sow it in your polytunnel. But it takes ages to get to this size on the left. Um, it seems to be like maybe two or three months from seed to this size. It seems to be the slowest growing thing. Um, now there's two sorts of celery, there's trench celery and the self blanching. Now trench celery is like the picture in the middle, the stuff that you get from the shops will be trench celery. So they top right hand picture here, you've got a trench um, that they're dug in, a bit like when I was saying with the leeks, you'd earth it up as they grow. You can get a tin, a baked bean tin or something and have the seedling in the bottom and let it go through or you can wrap it in newspaper or you can wrap it in newspaper before you fill in your trench now i've tried this and the thing just rotted so um i've always just grown self blanching which is a variety that essentially grows thick and bushy plants that when they grow close together they blanch themselves because it's lack of light that blanches things um and stops it going so green and the green just makes it more tough and less likely to want to eat it raw. Um, but I think, to be honest, the reason why I go for self blanching is because I only really cook with it anyway. I don't really like raw celery. So has anybody had any success with trench celery that they want to share? Any secrets? No? OK, well, essentially, my advice would be go for self blanching because it's just easier um, and it's quite nice to have in the same bed as lettuce. Okay, so celeriac, um, I grew really good celeriac once and that's when I did one row on the edge of a flower bed. And I think it actually, it just needs a lot of sunlight. Um, I've grown it at this correct spacing and when the leaves fold down like this, um, on the left-hand picture, I won't point with my finger because it doesn't really help, does it? When the um, leaves fold down like this, you're supposed to take those off and it's supposed to make the bulb grow bigger. Um, and it's meant to emulate grazing animals and the plant thinks, oh, I better store some energy. I'll make a bigger bulb. So that's what you're supposed to do. But I found that sunlight was the biggest secret to getting them to grow well and not growing them too close together. But I do find that when I've grown them, picking out all the dirt from the roots just annoyed me a bit, really. So I've stopped growing them now. Um, and I think it's in that grow what you eat and eat what you grow category. 
if you don't tend to buy a lot of celeriac from the shops, why bother growing it? But you might want to give it a go. So has anybody got any tips that are better than me that growing celeriac? I'm not sure about celeriac, but Tim has a question about blanching. Yes. Uh, Tim, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Very complicated question. It's what does blanching mean? It's where the light has been excluded from a plant and it stops it going green. So things that are blanched are leeks. You remember we were saying about um, putting the leek in a hole in the ground? Yeah, yeah. It's because if you don't do that, a leek will just be the green bit at the top and it won't have the white bit at the bottom. Oh, okay. And it's the white bit at the bottom that we like. Oh. Um, with celery, um, burying it or wrapping it in something stops the light getting to it and you get those white tender stems that you get in the shops. Oh, um, but okay. the self-blanching happens because it's got so many leaves and you do grow them quite close together that not much uh, sunlight gets to the stem anyway. So it's not quite as, they're not quite as white as um, when you do the trench celery, but they're paler than if you just have one plant on its own in the middle of oh, I see, I see. somewhere. And what does rust look like? We were talking about rust on leaves. What some, it? I've got a picture of rust in the onion bit. So okay. that will come up. I didn't think to put it in the leaks, to be honest. I don't know why. Okay. Um, I might change my slide order next year. Um, I'll go for spinach and chard. And I know that coming up is Whitloof chicory, which is another thing that you blanch. So, um, uh, but I'll just do things in order if that's all right. Uh, so spinach and chard. That, so there's two different sorts of spinach. There's perpetual, uh, there's... Um, true spinach which tends to go to seed easier and I'm trying to think what they call the chard can somebody remind me because my brain's gone dead perpetual, can, perpetual, perpetual spinach I was yeah I was thinking the right thing um and they perpetual spinach is basically chard I find that they are pretty different plants um chard is a tougher tasting leaf um, but you eat the stem as well as the leaves. So you've actually got two vegetables in chard. Um, you'd cut up the leaf quite finely, I find, and put it in things that you'd have spinach in. And then the stem, I would cook for a little bit longer in dishes, like stir fries. Um, but chard will not go to seed very easily, not like spinach. Spinach goes to seed really quickly. Um, and sometimes you can get chard that lasts the following year as well. Um, so lettuce, there's uh, so many different sorts of lettuce um, and they're really good for growing all the year round. So you've got cut and come again lettuce, which is like on the left here where you cut, you have one leaf or you have the ball head lettuce. So when you choose your seed packets, it will say what sort of lettuce it is. Sometimes it's actually separate in the catalogue. And I think, to be honest, I did cover lettuce, didn't I, when I did the, the small seeds slide, just growing it from seed like everything else. Um, so what have, I, what have I done? So celeriac and spinach and chard and lettuce, all these things, are gonna, you're going to raise them as seeds and then plant out the little, little seedling. OK, so summer onions. Um, there are a type of onion that you can overwinter. Um, I've found mixed success with those. I don't think they're any better really than just starting them off in February. I don't think there's a massive benefit in the size or the yield or anything like that. Um, so I've started just doing onions in February and March. Now, I really like this trick that Monty Don said about putting them in mo a module tray. You don't have to use very good compost. It can be like some old compost from a fl flower pot. Um, because they're not looking for nutrient here. You're actually looking to get them to have some roots. Um, because when you plant them outside, this, this is an onion, uh, onion set, they're called, which is just a mini onion on the left-hand side here. Um, and you've got the roots going to come out the bottom and the pointy bit is the top. So you plant when you plant your onions, you don't dig them in the ground like tulip bulbs. You put them half in and half out of the ground. 
I mean, you can see that's how they are in those little tra in the module trays. Now, the problem with that is birds think that they're a worm and they pull them out. So you might plant 50 or 100, and then two days later, you've got to go through and put them all back in again. The birds have taken them out. Um, you can get around that by putting a piece of horticultural fleece way down around the edges with your long, heavy things. Um, just on the ground and that stops the birds from pulling them out so that's one way of getting around it or just um, grow them in pots and then plant them out so that's the way I've found getting around birds planting them out I don't tend to do things like netting or um, string on the surface because I think they're likely to get their feet tangled um, and you should get your bulb growing sort of on top of the surface like this if you plant them too deep you'll get long thin bulbs because the bulb wants to expand. So that's why you have them on the surface there. Okay. And they're generally ready around July. They're reasonably early harvest. So if you realize that they're gonna be harvested quite soon, you can think about something that's gonna be planted after them. Okay, so this is onion problems then. So bottom left, that's rust. So it's a kind of orange, it's slightly raised, but not very much. It's like a dusty kind of thing. Um, mildew on the right here is another airborne disease. Um, and it's particularly bad if it's a wet summer um, and it can completely ruin your crop, uh, mildew. Um, I remember in 2012 thinking maybe I should erect some sort of waterproof layer to stop the onions getting so wet. Um, on the left here, this top left one, um, this I would say is the bane of my life, um, is white rot. I find rust and mildew, you can still get reasonable onions, um, but white rot will pretty much scupper that plant. Um, now, I think I've got it in the ground at the allotment, but I don't have it in my garden, or I didn't have it in my garden. And um, so I've gradually stopped doing Allium family in the allotment. And I actually only grow, the last year, I've only grown leeks um, because they don't tend to get it that well, that badly. Um, and last year I had some of my mum's onion sets and put them in the garden and I got white rot in the garden. And I know that it's not in the soil. And somebody said to me that you can actually import white rot on your onion sets, which I was quite horrified by. So quite disappointed really um so some way that you can get around that is growing onions from seed which might be why my leeks have worked better um so yeah white rot is a bit of a problem for some people and other people they've never heard of it and it's not a problem at all so who's had white rot in this group yes yes <laughs> it's a pain isn't it yeah <laughs> Have you found anything um, helps it? Um, no, but I just typed in the chat that I found that shallots and Welsh onions don't seem to suffer from it. So I put them at the allotment. And I think you're right about it being in maybe in compost and it can be imported on the in the bulbs. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Yeah. I, I did hear something um, about the life cycle of the fungus is apparently it stays in the soil for seven years, but if you plant an onion in the soil, it recognizes the smell and the spores release, and then it infects that onion and then does its little growing thing until it releases and then it stays in the soil again. Um, and so a way that you can get around it is by um, putting garlic cloves, crushed garlic cloves in a watering can and watering the soil because then the um, spores go, oh, onion, and release, and there's no actual onion to infect, so it can break the life cycle. But I tried that, and I wasn't sure how deep I was supposed to be watering this onion, um, <laughs> this garlic. So it's like, what do you do? Do you just do the surface and then don't touch it for so long and then put the onion sets in or you know how long do I need to leave it before I sow my onions and then also I heard something about garlic being antibacterial and therefore an antifungal so is it going to disrupt the life in the soil so I kind of got a bit confused about that one and gave up it didn't seem to make any difference even the bits that I did water with um with garlic mm, that's a shame mm. 
I mean, it must work somehow because people have put it somewhere as working. So, I mean, I've only tried it like once or twice. So it might be worth um, giving that a go and see what you think. I'd love to hear if anybody has found that works. Um, okay. So any more questions about onions? How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Okay, so brassicas are another thing that um, you I tend to grow on as little plants and then plant out. You can do them straight into the ground in rows. Now on these slides, this is my little patch that I've grown in the polytunnel, but this is a seed bed, this middle one. And so you can just sow them in rows in the seed bed. Um, but I just found that they grew better started off in little pots but if you don't have a um, greenhouse or polytunnel then just go straight into the seed bed um, but what I would say about all brassicas is they have a lot of things that eat them and all the things that eat them apart from slugs can be stopped with horticultural fleece so the way that I, I do it is I get a fresh piece for my brassicas and I use that for a couple of years you can see there's a little hole here it might even be three years um, that's not too bad a hole but if it's any bigger than that mm. I would then use it for all the other things like protecting my peas and putting on the ground um but it stops flea beetle and um cabbage whites and pigeons and um cabbage root fly and all these pests um, are all halted by fleece it's brilliant so I plant my little plants in the seabed grow them onto this one bottom left. When they're about that size, then I move them. This is cabbages on the left and cauliflower on the right. Things need a big space. So put them about, about a foot apart. So many of the things are about a foot apart or about an inch apart. So for beginners, then that, that's kind of an easy way of doing things. So yeah, about a foot, maybe a bit more. Um, and on the bottom right here, you can see this is basically continuation. So though the first four or six that I've planted and each two meter by two meter piece of fleece will cover between four and six cabbages. Um, and um, I've got five foot wide beds. So that tends to be my measurements. Um, if you're doing the no dig method, it's helpful to have a bed you can lean across so you don't stand on it. Um, and two and a half foot is about as much as I can lean without feeling like I'm stretching too far. So two by two meter fleece, four to six cabbages, um, it works a treat. So I've harvested five of my cabbages on the bottom right, one left, and I've done continuation by putting the next lot in. And I must say 2020, thanks to furlough, I finally cracked continuation of my brassicas and got so much yield from just doing this. But every time I replanted, I put some more compost on the top because they're hungry plants. So every time they got a fresh dressing compost. Okay, so lovely broccoli. I, I particularly like a variety called EOS. I don't know how you say EOS as a word, ES. <laughs> what is your question, Anita? Uh, it's another question from Tim. Is the fleece on a frame or just laid on the cabbages? So um, I was lucky enough to get given a load of these metal hoops when somebody moved to France. Don't you can see them. They are about a foot and a half wide, about a foot high. They got a loop on the bottom. I don't really need the loop. Um, but I've just got a stack of them and you can get um, plant supports or the sort of metal wire um, from on the internet. Um, I think it's plantsupports.com or something like that, really obvious. Um, and it's worth investing in something like that. But if you haven't got that, you can use plumber's piping, like the blue stuff, um, because it's sort of stiff enough that you can put it in the ground and um, have an arch. And I just do, you can see top right, I've got four hoops and then the piece of fleece draped over it. And then my long, trusty, long, thin, heavy things um, mm -hmm. to weigh it down around the edges. Is there any other questions, Anita? No. I was, I was yeah, saying- well, yeah. that... um, I have a question. Can I kind of butt in again? Sorry. Yeah. So, so how long do you keep the fleece on? Um, All the time. 
All the time, and, All until, the time. Right, right up until you harvest them. Yeah. Yeah, oh. because um, if you, uh, I found I do, you're used to do netting. Mm. I've tried various different structures with netting. If one leaf touches the edge of the netting, the, cat the cabbage white will just lay through the netting. Mm. Um, they, and that's another thing that the fleece prevents is white fly. So if you have netting, you can get a problem with white fly. Um, this, it just keeps everything out. I, and also, I think you get a like, nice warm environment in there. It doesn't seem to block out too much sunlight. It um, just keeps them nice and cosy. And it really is the key to success, I think, with brassicas. I haven't found anything that's worked as well. So, so, so it, they do get sufficient sun then? Yeah. 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 yeah it is, it's, um, you get winter weight and summer weight. I always get uh, summer weight because it's thinner. Um, mm -hmm. I figure if it needs winter weight, I'll put two layers on. And can, can you buy this fleece at any um, gardening store, gardening shop? Yeah, you can get it from Willowbrook and things mm -hmm. um, on the roll. Um, I'd, I'd like to investigate the, um, the wool one, but I haven't yet because I've still got some, so I'm afraid I haven't, mm -hmm. I haven't done the research. Um, so you can just basically, basically it can be used just as a cold frame, put some fleece in a frame and it's a cold frame? Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's how I use it. Um, it. You, can, you can use it on the ground as well. It's really great for germinating seed. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants a massive load of fleece or what, and is willing to unravel said massive ball of fleece, then we have managed to get some secondhand off a farmer. So if you would like some, then um, if you haven't got my email address or the group's email address, it's community.ttw at gmail.com. And we've got three huge, three miles worth of fleece that's slightly muddy around the edges. If you're willing to go and um, help yourself, you can have as much as you like for free. Um, <laughs> Helen, David is asking, does the rain get through the fleece? Yeah, yeah, rain gets through, sun gets through. It's a wonderful product. It's very good for organic growing. I mean, I know that the normal stuff is plastic, but... If we put it in the bin now, it gets taken to even now, burnt and made to, into electricity. You've got the wool biodegradable alternative now available. And because you're not having to spray or deal with any pests, it's for an organic grower, it's really valuable stuff, I think. Um, yeah. And you can use it year on year. So I think my fleece, I normally get five or six years out of it before it's too muddy and holy to, to use anymore. Okay, right. So yeah, that is uh, the nice, basically the fuzzy pictures are generally off the internet and the nice pictures are from my camera. So that is my broccoli that I grew mm. and my collie, which I'm quite pleased with, and my cabbage. <laughs> so yeah, I do love um, brassicas. I think they're... Um, a really nice staple food. Um, I don't think there's a type that I don't like. So yeah, love a bit of brassica. Oh, I, there is a type I don't like, and that's gonna come up in a minute. So potatoes, we did, is there anybody questions about any, anything else that we've just covered before I move on? No, cool. Um, so potatoes we did cover in the last talk, but probably everybody that's growing them has got chitting potatoes now on a windowsill somewhere. Um, if you haven't, I'd go and buy your seed potatoes soon because they're sell out, um, I think especially this year. Um, and if you can't get hold of them, if you get organic potatoes, they're not sprayed with something that stops them from chitting. Um, Non-organic potatoes are sprayed to inhibit the, the um, sprouts. Um, so you can just use them out of your cupboard. The ones that you buy as seed potatoes are meant to be disease free. And that's the main reason why people buy them. Um, so the bottom left picture is a decent picture of how they actually grow. They're a stem tuna, tuber, and they grow between, if the seed potato is one of these lower ones, the potatoes grow on top of where you plant the potato. Now this is a nice diagram of earth, what earthing up is, but it's not a great diagram of where the potatoes are because they're not here, they're in this bit. Like if that was your seed potato, about six inches below the ground, all the other potatoes are going to be above it. I just couldn't find a decent picture. Maybe I should draw one, eh? Um, so this is no-dig potatoes. Now, no-dig can also be called minimal till. 
And I have had to use a trowel to go six inches under the ground to make a little dip for it. But I don't feel that that's proper digging. It's only making a little hole, same as when you plant another plant. Um, so I've just got my manure on the surface. Right hand pitchy, I've, I've put all the potatoes on the surface. I've done a foot apart because these are um, second earlies. You can give main crops a bit more space, although to be honest, I don't really. I tend to just put everything a foot apart. Um, then the first thing that will happen is they'll grow little leaves or come up in the rows where you've planted them. Now earthing up is so you don't get green potatoes because if they lie on the surface, then I'll obviously get green. So in the past, I've always used a draw hoe. You can use whatever tool you have. I happen to have a draw hoe. It's really helpful because it's got this S bend neck and you pull the soil up from either side. Now I did check out Charles Dowden and how he does his, and this is acceptable as no dig because essentially he's saying that a lot of the surface of your soil is gonna be compost or manure from another year. So it's pretty much just moving mulch around. However, if you want to be really, really pinnacle of no dig, you'd get a load of compost and you just put it on top. Um, but I find it really hard to source that much compost. I've had, um, last year I got six wheelbarrows full of wood chip that I've had rotting um, in the, it was already pretty rotten when I got it and I've rotted it some more. So it's probably fine to put on the soil now. Um, and I reckon I've probably got enough there for one row and I normally grow four. So I don't know how I would get and store enough material to put just compost on the top. But if you are, if you are able to get that, then great. Um, so when I put my potatoes in, I always cover them in fleece right from the beginning. Some old dodgy bit of holy fleece, you can see the holes. And that late frost that we got last May is the reason you do this. So you don't have to run down in a panic at midnight because you've seen on the weather forecast it's going to frost because potatoes are tomato family and they do get had by the frost. So here is where I've basically had holes in my fleece. Um, and you can see that the frost has got them. We had three consecutive really hard frosts in May. Um, so it's good to watch out for that. Um, potatoes are beautiful, I think, when they're, especially when they're in flower. If you grow a type like cara, which is main crop, they seem to flower for ages and they don't seem to get, um, don't seem to die down and they even make little tomato-like fruit. Um, you want to watch out for blight. Blight happens really fast. It's not a slow dying down of leaves that most potatoes will get. It's, it, they go brown and they pretty much melt in a day. So um, if you get blight, take all the tops off um, straight away and then leave it completely for two weeks. Take your tops down to the pool tip because they have such hot composting it kills the spores. The, the spores will lie on the surface um, of the soil and after two weeks they'll die and they won't affect your potatoes when they pull them up. If you just leave it, the black will go down the stem and into the tubers, and then that's when you get in the tubers. So if you see really suspicious looking melting brown leaves, then just make sure you get them up, get all the tops off as soon as possible. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've never had it, which is really lucky. Hopefully, hopefully won't get it again. We've taken the tops off sometimes, worried that we might have had it, but I don't think we actually did. I think they were just dying. I'm so going to butt in here. What, yeah, what do you mean by take the tops off? Just, just um, cut all the greenery off. All the greenery? All the greenery. So if you get, this, um, get the feeling that you might be getting blight, that a patch or more of your greenery has gone brown and dissolved in about two or three days. Yeah then it's serious so you just take all of the greenery off don't touch the soil or the or the mounds or the potatoes or anything take the soil the greenery down the um the tip get rid of it don't put it on your compost and then leave it for two weeks before you harvest and then you shouldn't get blight in your potatoes so it's just a matter of keeping an eye on it and timing so the, the potatoes will just carry on growing into the ground without any greenery no, they don't, they don't grow after that, so it can stunt your yield a bit, um, but you tend to get blight at the point when they're pretty much finished growing anyway. Okay, so here's a question. If, if they're underground, how do you know when they're ready? 
Um, they generally don't pick them until they're flowering. Oh, okay. um, and I, t I, yeah, some of them I, I'll, I'll basically root around with your hands in the soil and just see what you can find. And if they're too small, then just don't unearth them all. That's something that's nice actually about no dig spuds is you don't actually have to dig with a fork. You can just root around with your hands. And in the polytunnel picture here, all of these ones, the majority, this is the last row that um, I had for the year. All of, all of those, that was, a, that was, I would say about two thirds of a row. I just got out with my hands. And then I went over with a fork just because I was curious and I got those ones out. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, if they were lying in the soil, it's, um, so I have to have a drink. And can you sort of leave, I mean, can you just, with potatoes, can you leave them in there until you want to eat them? Mm. Pretty much? Yeah, um, the longer you leave them in there, the more slugs will go in yeah, Of course, yeah. It's not like cabbages. There's no, there's no risk of them bolting or anything. You know? No, I mean they just, they just get more and more holes. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, you can leave them in pretty much till Christmas if you want, but um, okay. we tend to lift, we tend to eat them until we get to the point where we just think, oh, we'll take them all up now, which tends to be sort of August. Okay. We're complete novices, and uh, we, we, we were recommended charlottes. Are they quite nice? I like charlottes, but their um, the skins fall off. I find when you cook them, when you boil them, so they're best if you steam them. Oh, yeah. um, we really like Maris Pia. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I like those. Are they also salad? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions about potatoes? I'm looking at the time and think I've only got half an hour, so I should. Um, try and speed up a bit. So parsnips um, are really easy as long as you can get them to germinate. And I've discovered the secret of getting them to germinate is fleece on the ground. So I think now it's time to sow your parsnips outside. Um, I think I'll take them off the February talk because you can sow them in on sand really early. But actually, I find they work better if you just wait until late March. Um, so again, water the ground first. Um, current running theme. Um, so do your drills with your trowel. I've got a trowel there that is really handily one foot long. Um, it's six inches up until the sort of handle, and then it's um, a foot in total. So it's really helpful for measuring out my um, uh, seed drills. Um, so water it first, then I've put the seed in, you can just about see the seed in there, and then sprinkled soil on top, like with the leeks, cover it in fleece. Now this is an old bit of fleece, it's not even a square, it's got so many holes in. Um, I've got my long thin things laying it down, literally put it on the surface, and I would say that if you look at it in a week, the soil will still be wet in the drills. If you look at it in two weeks, it might still be wet. Um, and I think this is because the fleece traps some of the water in, stops it getting so baked by the sun. It stops birds eating the seed um, and it gives them a nice warm environment to germinate. And I just find it works really well. And so I've started doing it on pretty much everything that I sow. Um, and it keeps cats off if you've got a garden um, and you've got a cat problem. because They love a bit of fresh dirt, don't they? Um, so is that okay, generally, as a rule of thumb for sowing seed? Um, carrots, there's um, one main problem with carrots. Um, if you just have a look, um, slightly irrelevant, but there's a nice picture of the seedling there, um, of the little two wispy leaves that you get as a carrot seedling. Main problem is carrot fly. Other than that, they're really easy, but this is a bit of a problem. So carrot fly are a little fly that apparently are really weak and they can't fly very well. And they can only get two foot off the ground. Um, so one of the things that you can do is do a little fence around them. So this is a fence two foot high. I've done that before once really well. The next year didn't work, the flies got in. So I don't know what I did differently. Maybe my fleece, well, I actually used um, Envirometch, which is a 
a strong version of fleece. I think all three of these things is going to be EnviroMesh. It's quite expensive. Um, I think actually this one with the top is, or this one, which is a tunnel, is probably better because the thought that the flies only fly two foot off the ground is great. But what if it's windy? Don't you think the fly could maybe be gusted over the, the, um, the fence type thing? So I think that's what happened the last time I had um, them in a fence. And that's, um, that's what happened is actually they just got blown over the top. Um, so this year I had really good success with carrots on the top of a water butt. So I had two pots on top of this water butt that must have been four or five foot off the ground, worked really well. Um, not so well was the one in my garden, which I raised off the ground because the slugs got in it. And so this nice foliage was lovely in spring. And then about two days later, it was completely decimated by slugs. And you can see the measly little carrots I got there in comparison to the one decent one that I had at the allotment. So um, I think possibly having it on bricks, which was a nice little home for the slugs. Um, and they just they just loved it in that pot. But you can get pots that are rough on the outside and less likely to get slugs crawling up them. Um, so but yeah, generally uh, carrots in pots work really well. I think a lot of gardeners will tell you that. And you can do consecutive sowings where you just sow one pot at a time and have them on a sort of rotation. So um, you can also pick them out individually and leave smaller ones in. So you can sort of just scatter sow them on the surface and then pick them out as they feel ready. And you just use your finger around the top and feel how big it is. And if it feels like a big enough one, then you can pull it out. And I think because it's just compost in a pot, it doesn't compact. So you can just literally pull them out. OK, so any questions on carrots? Any of your own hints and tips? Uh, Chris is asking a question. Is, is there a risk with no dig that the carrot gets stunted as it hits harder soil? But I think Jane has responded already saying, no, they're fine. I agree, really good yeah. job, no dig. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. I just, I just find quite often I just get tiny, like one inch thick, very broad carrots and then they just stop. And I've always assumed it's because I've not, uh, I've just been lazy <laughs> when I've been planting them and um, it should have turned the soil over more. But if we're going to be no digging, then I, I just wondered if that was a bigger risk. Or maybe you need to put a dibber in for deeper down, or I don't know. Um, I think with, with no dig, the, one of the main things to do is not stand on the soil ever, if you can help it. Um, when, when you're growing different crops, some things are dug. So I was digging my parsnips the other day, and I know that you cannot get parsnips out of the soil without digging. So if those parsnips are in rotation around the garden then that bit of soil is always going to get dug at some point um leaks are kind of intermediate because you can actually put a fork in and kind of just lift the soil and pull the leak out especially when it's rainy but what i found that is we've been probably no dig for about 10 years and the soil is so light and friable actually it's just perfect for pulling things out and all that so actually if you don't stand on it after a while it will any compaction will be relieved um, but if you if in doubt I mean um, something like potatoes if you want to put them in and then dig them out it mixes the compost a lot into the soil so you can always have that on rotation to um, to dig them once a, once every five years or something but I, yeah I don't think you really need to. Can I ask something Helen? Mm, yeah. Um, I, I've just literally started no dig and um, the soil is fairly uh, together. Can I, um, I don't want to disturb it at all, but just like you do perhaps with a lawn, just gently ease it with a fork. Yeah, I think if, if your soil is quite solid and compact, to start with, a little bit of forking wouldn't go amiss. Um, if it's been trodden on for a while, um, I think the what um, the real kind of stalwarts of no dig would probably say it was totally unneeded. But I think if you've got a bit of compaction, it's quicker, isn't it? 
you can let the plants do it and the worms do it of their own accord, but it might take you a year. Um, something that Andy recommended that I really would agree with is if you've got an area that you're concerned is really compacted, if you lay compost on the surface for six months, when you, if you took that compost off, it is amazing how much softer the soil is. And I've just found that at Longacre where I put a load of um, uh, mulch, like grass mulch on this area. And when I came to plant a chestnut um, a couple of days ago, the soil was amazing under it because all the worms have gone all compost and come up and down and up and down. And that really does help with compaction. So it's maybe something to do at the end of the year. If you put a nice thick layer of mulch on for the winter, by the spring, it should really be a lot less compacted. Um, doesn't really help this time of year, but yeah. <laughs> right, so um, beetroot. Now for beginners, beetroot is really easy, I think. Um, I've never had a problem with it. Somebody said that the birds eat the little seedlings once, but I guess you can maybe solve that with a bit of fleece, my old favorite. Um, <laughs> uh, I should sell the stuff, shouldn't I really? Uh, um, so on the left-hand side here, I love a little beetroot seedling. You can actually see that even the stem of the beetroot is purple um, as a little seed. Now this is Boltardi. I have got a rogue white one there. You see there's not the purple, uh, stem the um, vein down the middle of the leaf and I've got a rogue white one they're never as tasty I don't think um, but they are generally really quite easy um, to grow I tend to do a few in modules and plant them out just to get an earlier crop and then sow them sort of April the end of March April um, and you can do successive sowing but actually I just sow them fairly close together and then I pick out the big ones and then the little ones grow um, to take over. So I don't tend to even bother with successive sowing and I always end up with a few left at the end of um, the summer that I've got to get out before they go mouldy. But Boltardi is a really good variety. It doesn't tend to go particularly woody. And I think once they've been in for six months, then they are starting to get a bit woody. But Anybody like growing beetroot here? Yes, yes. Good stuff. Yeah. Any questions? Why don't people eat the leaves of beetroots as much as they should? Because they're delicious. Um, I mean, I don't tend to just because um, if you're eating the leaf, are you going to um, slightly stunt the bowl? They are just the same as chard. You can just eat the leaves. Yeah. I make a really nice beetroot, beetroot leaf curry. Very good. Is that when you get beetroot with the leaves on? Mm. Yeah, I think that's fine, isn't it? Because you're um, eating the whole plant um, rather than um, picking the leaves while the beetroot's growing. Mm. Right. Um, so spring onions, another easy one. I've actually redone my pictures that I put in for leeks because they were actually spring onions. Um, <laughs> but yeah, really easy. Apparently, if you want to be self-sufficient, you have uh, spring onions in around April, May. You have your main crop onions um, from like June to August, well, maybe a bit later. You'd have them all up until Christmas, I suspect. And then by the time you've run out of onions, you start on your leeks and then the leeks keep going until March. So you have your spring onions again. Um, so turnips, this is the one brassica that I don't like. I said I was going to come to it, didn't I? Can't stand the things. We grew them once. They are so easy. If you're a beginner and you like turnips, definitely grow them. They don't need any protection. None of the insects seem to like them either. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is about turnips, but they're just, they're, they grow like radishes. You've actually got to make sure you get them before they get too big. So sort of tennis ball size is really the maximum you want to have your turnips. And yeah, just really easy, pest resistant. Don't like them, so I don't grow them, but <laughs> if you like them, then go for it. Uh, radishes, uh, same as turnips, just really easy. Um, but you can, because they're quite a small plant, you can grow them in between other rows. Now here I've got them in between the beetroot. So on the bottom left 
the uh, bottom right picture, you can see that the rows are far too close together. And that's because the beetroot is a foot apart, but the radish is in between. You can do the same with parsnips, um, carrots if you want, uh, lots, of, lots of things that you can um, put a few radishes in between um, as they grow. So chicory is another sort of plant that you blanch. So it's dandelion family. So you get a really nice, big, juicy root. You don't, don't tend to eat that. I think it is edible, but it's not the thing you're trying to grow. When, you, when it's growing fully in the season, then you're looking at something that looks a bit like a dandelion, loads of green leaves. Now you wouldn't want to eat those leaves because they're very bitter. But when you harvest it at the end of the year, what you're looking to harvest, funnily enough, is actually the root. When you take all the greenery off, there'll probably be a little bit of the nice blanched leaves in the centre of it because they've not got sunlight. Now they're nice to eat. So in the winter, November maybe, you harvest your root and you put it in a pot of compost. So um, you can put it in a garage is ideal. I don't have a garage, unfortunately. My parents have got um, a garage and it works so well for them. Um, I have mine in the airing cupboard. Um, and then in the middle of the winter when it's cold and horrible outside, you can go and pick these beautiful leaves that come up from the root in the dark. Um, and they're lovely, especially with a um, cannellonian bacon and cream thing that I discovered, lovely. Um, one problem, the reason why I'm not allowed to grow them anymore, we did manage to bring some green fly into the airing cupboard. <laughs> so um, that was my experiment with chicory. But yeah, we're really worth growing a nice, a nice surprise. And particularly if you've got a garage, you're not going to notice a few green fly in the garage, I don't think. And actually my mum said she didn't get them in, in hers. It might have just been the heat, actually. Garage seems to be totally the opposite of airing cover. The garage is cold, the airing cover is hot. Maybe that's it. It's probably too warm. Yeah. So, so I mean, a cold garage would be all right. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, the other thing is that possibly if I'd have bought compost rather than just using some old compost that had probably been lying around and got flies in it, it'd probably help as well. Uh, Jane, did you have a question or a comment? Oh, just just that my garage is too cold and I put mine in, in the cupboard under the stairs. So the, the hoover and everything else had to come out into the room. And then there's a great big tub of chicory sat in the dark under the under the stairs all winter. Brilliant. Yeah, did you find any problem with green fly? No. Brilliant. Yeah, my parents' garage is actually in between two terraced houses with um, um, upstairs on top. So I suppose it is kind of part of the house. Um, so that's probably why it wasn't as cold as a garage outside. I suppose it depends on how insulated your garage is. If it's maybe stone wall and it's got, um, you know, something around it, maybe it'd be a bit warmer than if it was on its own. Yeah. Okay. But again, really easy to grow. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're looking at some tender veg now. All these things need proper protection from the frost. You grow them just the same as anything else. I like root trainers for my tomatoes and aubergines and things because they all fit on the windowsill in my bathroom nice and neatly. Um, mine are somewhere in between these two pictures at the moment. Um, I tend to plant them between the end of January and Valentine's Day. Um, when, but they start looking leggy really quite quickly and um, you need to move them somewhere else. So the, this is um, horticultural bubble wrap. The reason why it's special bubble wrap is because it's slightly resistant to sunlight and it won't disintegrate into a million pieces like um, the stuff you get for packing. Um, this is a water pipe. And I've just got it on a shelf and I've actually wrapped it all the way around the shelf and, and on the sides. And it keeps the frost off really well in the polytunnel. So it's got essentially two layers, um, but that tends to keep the frost off. Um, so this is how I plant my tomatoes. I've got um, each one of these rows is about 45 centimetres apart. And then the tomatoes themselves, I put two in the rows um, in my polytunnel, three of their cherry tomatoes. The cherries seem to be able to go closer together. 
My favorite tomato is Furline F1 um, and it's a brute, so it needs space. So maybe if you've got a more delicate looking tomato, like these cherries are sun gold, I can fit three in a row there, but the fur lines are monstrous, so they have to have space. So these giant red ones are the fur lines. I love them because they're great for sauces. They've got a thin skin, hardly any core, hardly any seeds. They're really fleshy. Um, and the sun gold, these little cherry tomatoes that are in absolute fruit profusion. Um, but with tomatoes, they do, their main problem is blight. Um, they need a lot of food as well. If you can possibly give them a high potash food like comfrey juice, which we covered how to make it in the last talk, then that's really helpful. But you can see how they're all kind of triffids and going all over the place in the polytunnel. And this is actually, I have um, been pruning these as well. So if you put your tomatoes in a polytunnel or greenhouse and you just leave them and you don't take any of the leaves off, you're just asking for blight, basically. Um, so we've got a door at both ends of our polytunnel. So you get airflow going all the way through. Um, and um, what was your question, Anita? Because I think I might cover. Uh, there's a little flurry of questions. Um, when do you yeah, maybe carry on and then do yeah, them about tomatoes? Okay, um, they're all about tomatoes. Okay, so um, this is this is the first bit of pruning that you do on a tomato. It's called pinching out the side shoots. So on the left hand side here, you've got a lovely picture, and it's looking at this is this is where the tomatoes are coming off. So this one on the right with the yellow flowers, it's coming straight off the main stem. Now, a leaf will also come off the main stem, but you can get this little guy coming off at a 45 degree angle and you want to cut that off because otherwise, in a cordon tomato, you're wanting to, them to grow nice and thin um, and tall. If they get too bushy, the main, you, can, you can get tomatoes on the side shoots and things like that, but they just get so clogged up and congested, you don't get the airflow around. And airflow is what you want with tomatoes. Um, as they start growing up higher, you'd start taking off the lower leaves. And that again, stops the leaves touching the ground. It stops when you water them, it stops the leaves getting wet. Um, and so blight being the reason why you want to do these things is it generally happens when the leaves get wet. So if you're growing tomatoes outside, I've never had success with tomatoes outside. I think probably cherry tomatoes are the only things that work okay. Um, and I still get blight every time a lot earlier than in the polytunnel. And that's because when it rains, basically, the, it rains, they get wet and then they're susceptible. Um, and this fungal spore will get onto the stem. So if you see any of these little things, then that's what you're looking at for blight. So questions, Anita? Uh, so. We have, first of all, Peter asking, when do you move your tomatoes to the polytunnel? Um, I don't wait until the last frost. They, I do actually move them on as soon as they get leggy, which I, I would say is probably late April, early April, sometime in April, I think. It depends really when you sow them. So I've, I've taken them out, this picture on the right here, is basically as tall as I want them to get before they're going to get so leggy. And then I've put them in the polytunnel and potted them on um, into these bigger pots um, where they can get into better plants. And Tim is asking about your favourite tomato. How do you spell it? F-E-R-L-I-N-E. -E. And it's an F1. F1. Which okay. is the slightly fancy one. Hope you got that, Tim. Um, get down to Willowbrook. <laughs> and Chris and Jane are asking about, so can you go to your next slide? That's it. Um, they're asking, what were the plant pots in the ground ah. doing in the last yeah, photo? Well done. Um, so um, when you feed tomatoes comfrey juice, you want to feed it at the feeder roots. So when you have a plant, uh, pretty much all plants, they have a tap root coming down and then feeder roots near the surface. Now there's no point giving food to the tap root because that's not the one that takes the food. So where I've planted them, I've got a dinner plate sized depression in the soil. 
And when I put the food in, like as in the comfrey, I water the soil um, in that little depression. And just putting a depression in the soil stops them, the water running away. Now, when I um, water them with plain water, I water into the pots because that gets to the root. So it's just a bit of water conservation in a polytunnel um, and food conservation. So it, it makes it a bit quicker as well. So I sort of do a three second pour in the pots and I water them with water every other day and I water them with food every other time. So that'll be four, every, every four days, won't it? Um, or until I run out of food. <laughs> One thing I have discovered with the pots is sometimes it can trap these little beetles. So I've started putting ladders out of a little bit of wood or a bamboo cane or something like that. And it just helps any little beetles that get trapped in there, they can climb out and spiders. Any other questions? You got your hand up, Anita? No? no. <laughs> that was me. Sorry. Cool. Right, so um, essentially tomato blight is caused by stuffy, um, damp conditions. Um, they don't, tomatoes are not, they're not so bad with a little bit of cold. So I tend to open both my polytunnel doors after the last frost and keep them open all, all summer. And then I close them when it starts getting frosty again. Now, if you can't grow tomatoes, if you always get blight, then grow aubergines instead, because aubergines like the opposite. They like it damp and stuffy and hot. Now I do grow the same, the same in the, I do grow both in the polytunnel. I think keeping it airy for the tomatoes makes the aubergines suffer a bit. I still get aubergines though, so um, I'm not too worried. I, I have done a second polytunnel inside the polytunnel before. Main problem with that is letting the bees in to pollinate them. Um, so uh, that's, that's sort of medium success. They seem to like it nice and hot, but then if you don't get the pollinators, you're not gonna get any fruit. I found that I got two batches of aubergines that year, coinciding with the two times I actually lifted up the flap and let the bees in. Um, good if it's a cold year, I think. And uh, Andreas, you might recognize this aubergine. That is a proper proud moment, isn't it? But it's such a beautiful fruit. Um, when you have a, a nice shiny aubergine, it's pretty special. So these are my aubergines last year. Um, they kind of hang on the fruit in these really prickly, stiff stems. Um, I just, you've got to cut, bring your scissors with them. There's no amount of twisting that will get those things off without scissors. Um, so yeah, definitely worth growing aubergines if you, um, if you eat them and especially if you struggle with tomatoes. Any questions on aubergines? No. Uh, so sweet peppers, peppers, chili peppers and sweet peppers, I'm gonna talk about in the same breath. Um, if they have a thin skin, they're much more likely to go red. Uh, they need a lot of sunlight. So you need to get outside in a polytunnel or um, somewhere outside as soon as you can. So if you sow them early or buy plants. Um, some a tip that I did read once is putting paper around them because it's white or white paper anyway, as you can have different colors, um, reflects some sunlight up onto the plant. So it helps with a bit more sunlight, but they're definitely a kind of tropical plant. Um, and you're gonna get redder fruit if you have more sunlight. Um, this is this is a really nice variety, I think, called Thor F1. Really expensive seeds, they're like two pound fifty for seven seeds. But I really like it. And you can see these little supports I've got. These are plant supports. You know, I was saying about that plantsupports.com or whatever it was called. Um, I've got quite a few of these taller supports now for flowers. And this plant Thor is so prolific, it can break under the weight of its own peppers sometimes. It's just amazing. Um, and um, so many of them go red. It's really nice. It's like a, it's not so thin that it's not nice to eat, but it's thin enough to ripen. So I do rate those. Um, but you can get sort of big chunky bell peppers as well. They tend to ripen less easily. And chilies are just basically a small pepper. I find that um, I grow two chili plants every two or three years, and then you can freeze the chilies and that keeps me going in chilies. And I do eat quite a lot of them, but they're so prolific that you don't, I don't find I need to grow chilies every year. So hence not having my own photos because I didn't take photos last year. Okay, any questions about chilies? 
or peppers. There are some dwarf chili plants, like beware of that. If you're putting them in the polytunnel, not to buy dwarf ones or not to buy normal ones if you've got them on your windowsill. Make sure you look on the packet of whether they're dwarf or not, whether it suits your situation. Because um, when you've got space in the polytunnel and you plant them and then they don't grow much more than that, it's quite, quite disappointing. Um, right, so courgette is another frost tender plant. Um, it's quite a big plant. This picture on the right here, you can see my spinach all going to seed. I was saving the spinach seed. You see how tall my peas are, it's about a metre tall. These leaves are large. So if you're a beginner and you haven't grown courgette before, be aware that you're gonna need a square metre for one courgette plant. Um, you don't need to grow more than about five or six plants because then you can sometimes end up with some of the plants becoming all male and not having any, um, any courgettes on. Um, apparently if they get, if you have more than eight or something like that, then they know and they don't, they, you end up with male and female ones. Whereas if you grow less than eight, then you're more likely to get all producing um, courgettes. I do find that I always seem to have one runt of the litter that doesn't grow very well. I have no idea why, I think it's just the seed. So I can't see I'm doing anything different with them, but I always seem to have, oh, I grow eight, there's always one runt that doesn't grow properly. <laughs> Anyone else experience that? Is it just me? <laughs> just me. Oh, sorry, yeah, I would say that with courgettes, I mean, we eat quite a few courgettes. I would have thought five plants would give you way too many courgettes. Um, I, I, I reckon two is enough <laughs> for us. And you yeah. just really need to keep an eye on them because they, uh, they, because the leaves are so big, you can suddenly come back about a, a, a week later and find that something that was a tiny little thing one day is just a huge big marrow that's been lurking underneath all the leaves. So you just need to keep an eye on them. Yeah. I don't find yellow ones work as well. I don't know if anyone's found that. I've never grown yellow ones. Oh, I don't always try and grow a yellow one. They're quite nice, but um, they just don't seem to be as prolific. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm trying to remember what type I, uh, I grow. I think it might be Romanesco or something. I like the stripy ones. But yeah, I love courgettes. So we, we'll grow between six and eight plants for two of us and get through them pretty much because I just eat them until they're coming out in the ears, really. Yeah, I do find that with courgettes and tomatoes, they self-seed all over because of the compost. I don't know. I don't think the seeds get killed when you put them in the compost. So every year I just have mm. loads, loads of them cropping up all over my vegetable patch. And some, some of them I just replant, you know, and um, they do fine. You've got to be careful with um, saving squash seeds because um, squash and courgette can cross-pollinate and you end up with this monstrous, horrible thing that doesn't taste very nice. So well, it tastes really watery. It's like, okay. a, it's like a knobbly marrow or a tasteless squash. Okay. They're really not very nice. So um, I'd be a bit aware of, I don't know whether it goes the other way round. I've only ever known it if people have yeah. saved squash seeds that have cross-pollinated with courgettes, whether it would be the same the other way. Um, but yeah, I've not, I've not found any problem with them um, seeds in my compost actually um i did have a uh, butternut squash once in the compost anita ty ty's uh, has had had success growing them up a cane tripod oh brilliant sounds good uh, yeah andreas is suggesting that we call that new vegetable a snozcumber <laughs> <laughs> and uh tim is asking what what is happy in the shade apart from lettuce, which Jane is. We, did, we covered, um, the, if you have a look on YouTube, there's a list, I think, um, of things that are good in shade on the last okay. talk. And also um, in the veg talk notes from February, um, if you want it written down. No, I, I remember now, yes, I remember, yeah. Essentially things that are more leafy and tend to go to seed more. So spinach, coriander, um, things like that, that um, and lettuce um, are good in shade. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. A lot of these things that like uh, that are frost tender, like a lot of sun, they tend to be like Mediterranean tropical plants. So um, all of the ones in this section will want your sunniest spot. Okay. Um, so cucumber and gherkin. Um, gherkins, I mean, both of them really, they're just as bad as courgettes for like forgetting about and then having a massive one. Um, 
gherkins especially if you want little ones you've really got to check them every day or every other day um quite easy to grow i bear in mind that the plants are quite spiny and rough so make sure that you tie them up the structure that they're meant to be tied up regularly otherwise you'll have be picking amongst these kind of rough leaves and they're a bit scratchy so just just to warn you about that um generally just try and tie them up regularly as you go um they don't like the roots being watered so it's helpful to have a pot next to them like tomatoes i think they're more likely to get disease if you wet the root too much, as in the stem where it goes into the ground um too often um if you if you're growing them indoors or actually probably outdoors as well then try and find all female varieties um because if you get ones with if you get male plants apparently they're quite bitter um the fruit um so yeah when you're buying the seed just look for all female varieties and you can get ones that are greenhouse only or indoors and outdoors or just outdoors uh, the outdoor ones tend to be called ridge cucumbers and they tend to have um the nobbles on a little bit more okay I find that pretty much every year my cucumber gets to a certain point and gets, um, I think it's mosaic virus. I don't know whether that's just something that everybody gets at a certain point, um, but Monty said once that you can actually do a cons cons uh, continuation of sowing and sow another one in about May. And then when your first cucumber starts looking a bit dodgy, take it out and replace it. So I think it must be quite a common thing that they just come to the end of their life um, a little bit earlier in the year than you'd hope. Anybody else found that? Not mosaic virus, but <clears throat> my cucumber has wilted and died before, and I think I just overwatered it because I, I thought they liked a lot of water, but then it, it appears not. It might be that you were watering the stem of the root then. Um, I think, I think maybe it's a mildew or something that mine gets. It sort of goes white and powdery, and then I just dig, dig it up. Mm. Um, so who, who am I looking at there? Sorry, your name's not coming up. I've got my hand up. Uh, I think mine's mildew. Like right. So white, white powdery, and then just all collapses. I think you might uh, be mildew. 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 Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is mildew. Yeah. Um, the same happens with courgettes and um, squash and I just think well at the end of the day it's, it's always happens to me it happens worse if I don't water things outside I'm a real one for not watering anything outside really um, so they're more likely to get the mildew on your courgettes outside of you not been watering them I pretty much don't water the, anything outside really I'm quite bad um, but it all grows well. I think it helps with the no dig method and the mycorrhizal fungi and just watering the hole before you plant it and get away with not watering things is more than you realise, I think. So squash and pumpkin, sorry for the terrible pictures. I had no pictures on my photos, even though I did grow them last year. Um, but essentially they will, um, they'll just grow happily away and then in October you get this mildew, all the leaves go and then suddenly, oh, you've got your um you've got your squashes and your pumpkins i really like a variety called baby bear um and i wasn't able to get the seed for ages and then i found it at willowbrook so i've got it again this year and um, i'm quite pleased that i've got my favorite variety back but there's so many different types of squash it's really quite interesting all the different shapes and sizes you can get but essentially i find there's sort of two different textures you've either got the ones that are a bit potatoey like butternut squash or you've got the ones that are like more courgette like proper pumpkins. And I've discovered that I prefer the courgette flavored ones um, in things like risotto because it's not quite so claggy, um, but the potato -y ones are good in soups. So I think squash and pumpkin are very easy to grow for beginners. Um, you can also grow them on in pots and then plant them after you start harvesting things like that come out early. So your first crop of peas, your first early, second early potatoes, mm. um, your onions, those things will be out of the ground. And if you've got had your squash held in a pot, getting bigger and bigger, you can actually plant it out in like June even, and it still give you a good crop. So quite handy for small gardens, even though this, they are a bit of a triffid if you just, um, just got them up. 
Okay, so beans. Um, you've got two different sorts of beans, dwarf and climbing beans. And it's really important to look at the seed pack as a beginner, because if you go and put all your bean poles up and then you ended up getting dwarf beans, it feels like such a waste of time. So dwarf beans get to about a foot, foot and a half tall. Um, I found that they, you tend to get a crop sooner than the ones that go up the poles. So I've actually got both varieties this year so that I have some early beans and then some later beans. Um, I like on my, um, I didn't actually have a good photo of it. I need to take one for next year. I like an A-frame bean tunnel um, because I like walking down the middle of it and picking my beans because the beans will always hang down. So if you have your um, bean structure sloping, they'll hang down nice and easily for you to pick. And also when it's really hot in the summer, it's really nice being in the shade of a bean tunnel. Um, so I very much recommend that. We tend to have two sloping sides and then an A-frame at the top and then cross brace them on the top and on the sides as well in X's. And that keeps the stability in the wind because um, a lot of the time bean structures will fall down in the wind if they're not properly um, sturdy. So yeah, I do quite like my bean tunnel. I'll make sure I'll have a decent photo for it next time. So anybody got any questions about beans? Uh, I'm running 10 minutes over, so I'll just crack on. I always find by this point in the talk that the last little bit, I end up rushing. So um, sweet corn. Um, I've actually grown mini pop for the last few years because of badgers at my allotment. They seem to um, be a real problem down there on everybody's sweet corn. So if you grow a variety that never ripens properly and you're harvesting it unripe, then the badgers don't eat it. Jane, do you have badgers down yours? Jane, did you have a question? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Oh. <laughs> um, no, not a question exactly, but um you know sweet corn crosses really really easily so uh, um we we ask people not to grow mini or popcorn at our allotment site because you might wreck everybody's main crop sweet corn oh, so i'm just right. you know <laughs> well i was actually going to um just grow um mm. normal sweet corn sweet corn at home this year because the um it's so beautiful actually um and you see these prairie grasses how well it actually fitted in the border so i'm going to try normal sweet corn um here i mean with the mini pop i think don't you harvest it really before it has the seed head i don't know whether it would have pollinated it depends how close other people's i Things mean are. you yeah, yeah. Not sure. I'll have to ask anybody if they've suffered with their sweet corn. Yeah, because I grow popcorn, but I make sure I do it at home and not take it to the allotment. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, with um, with the mini pop, um, you're looking at harvesting it before Very it's early. ripe. Yeah. So um, I've heard people saying that they try growing the mini one and it's been horrible and it's because they've left it to be big. Um, but anyway, wh whichever one you choose, um, you basically plant it in the same way. And I've, I've always done mine about a foot apart. I have read the packet and it says two foot. I don't know, that seems like a bit excessive to me. I found that they're always fine with about a foot, foot and a half. But you want to grow them in blocks rather than rows because they are a type of grass. So mm. they um, wind pollinate which is why you're saying about um, cross-pollinating if it's windy. It might just be because I'm down the sort of corner of our allotment at the bottom that it's not, I've never heard anybody saying about it, but I'll ask my neighbours if they've had any problems. Um, sweet corn's also really great at intercropping. So um, here I've got lettuce in between. Um, I actually planted one lot in between tulips that were dying as well. And that was really great because it sort of was a better use of space. Um, and talking about intercropping, you've got the three sisters, which you might hear of quite a lot, where you've got um, sweet corn growing with beans at the foot of them. Now, you generally sow the seed of the bean once the sweet corn is in and growing, because otherwise the bean is not going to have enough to grow up. 
Um, and then you have your um, squash at the base of the sweet corn. Now, I think um, I've always found that it's, the, the squash hasn't done quite so well because it's been in shade of the sweet corn. And the beans are a bit difficult to pick because they're kind of all over the place. So I think it's, I really liked it in the garden where I had loads of flowers around it as well and it just all blended well and I got a bit of harvest, but I think mm. I, I'm gonna just stick to growing them separately, I think at the allotment because um, for a decent crop, I think you get better when you're growing them specifically on their own. But I think if you've got a garden, it's worth, worth having a go with. Any questions, any thoughts on the three sisters? Um, David has a question. Can you use root trainers for parsnip? No, if you, um, all the things that you sow in situ, which were chicory, parsnip, carrots, I think if there's anything else, it was potatoes, wasn't there? Um, all of those things generally, if you move them, then they're gonna distort the root. So if it's got a long tap root, you wanna leave that in, in place. So um, always sow your parsnips and your carrots and your chicory on, in the place that you're gonna grow them because um, they just don't transplant well at all. Um, okay, so I think we're pretty much done for vegetables. I've only gone quarter of an hour um, over. And the rest of it is really just a little bit that I tack on the end in case I've got um, time. And this year I tacked on a little bit about perennials. Now, um, asparagus takes a long time to actually come to fruition. You plant the crowns and then three years later you're allowed to pick them. Um, so they're a bit of a time commitment, but this is our asparagus bed and the frothy, ferny leaves. Um, that you end up with and they do need a bit of support for falling over so we've got this little frame that they grow through but I must say now I'm actually properly picking them they have been worth it um, and sorrel is a sort of perennial that's a bit like spinach um, it's dock family um, mm. and it's got a beautiful flavour a lemony flavour and it's no maintenance and you get all these lovely fresh leaves just at the hungry gap time of year and then another flush in sort of late autumn. So they're really, that's a really nice leaf to grow. Um, artichoke, honestly, quite fiddly. Um, this is the, the heart that you want to be aiming at eating. You can have a little bit of flesh off the bottom of the leaves as well and um, dip it in garlic butter and things. Um, but as a stately plant in your garden with these beautiful flowers that are great for bees, they are quite beautiful. Um, Jerusalem artichoke are another perennial. Um, I would say if you're going to grow them, I would buy the tubers online that are nice and big and round because most of what, if you get offered them by somebody, they'll probably be these little spindly ones. There's two different types. And they've just basically bred them so that they're better tubers. And I think if I was going to have a bit of my ground um, dedicated to them again, I'd get the big tubers. Um, we used to have them at the allotment. We had them a couple of years. They do um, play my stomach up a little bit, so I've stopped growing them. I do quite like the flavour. A beautiful sunflower plant, really quite attractive. A lot of people say you can never get rid of them. I had no problem. I just got rid of them. They're where the asparagus um, is now. And we just dug them up one year. We were thorough at digging them up. We did dig and we didn't have them back the next year. So they are easy to get up if you do actually do it thoroughly. So um, I guess it's when it get, they get entangled maybe with your perennial plants. But they're a problem. Um, any comments so far about any of those? Um, so Taunton kale is a perennial sort of kale and it's um, from around here as well. So it's a um, local um, plant. And all, another thing that's really great for the Hungry Gap, the beautiful leaves like this are um, really nice at this time of year. Um, later on, they look a bit sort of tough and I don't tend to eat them, but um, in the Hungry Gap, they're great. Fruit obviously is your big perennial um, crop. Um, I wouldn't really bother planting it anywhere after the end of March. So if you want to get any fruit in, get it in now. Um, it does tend to need to be netted if you want to have it as a really good crop. Um, 
things that don't need netting are autumn raspberries, funnily enough. Um, mm. White currants are less likely to get eaten by the birds. Um, so I'm nearing the end now. I'm glad because my voice is giving up. Um, strawberries, something I learned last year. So I did really well with the put potash from the fire round the, round the strawberries to start with. Then I put a bit of compost, my last little bit of compost I had left remaining on lockdown. I put some um, bark chippings round as well that was quite well rotted and some straw. So I'd um, done well with all my preparation. In the spring, absolutely masses of flowers bottom left um, corner. And then we had that frost in May. Didn't realize actually that strawberries get affected by the frost so much. Now on this middle picture, you can see the strawberries that got um, frost damage. I was accepting mm. the fact that those would all um, rot. But what I didn't realize was these flowers, can you see the middle is dark? Whereas this is a healthy strawberry that's green. All of the flowers that were on in May didn't produce strawberries. So one of my rows completely didn't do anything. The, another couple of rows sort of came back to life, but I was really disappointed. And um, so now I know you need to protect strawberries if there's a frost. So just um, learning from my mistakes there. Um, <laughs> anybody else have that this year? No. And then cut flowers. I always like to have a few cut flowers dotted around the garden. I think it um, helps with pollination of your crops um, and nice to uh, get some nice showy things for a bouquet. Um, I need to concentrate. I tend to be a bit more um, filler and no thriller at the moment. Um, later in the year, I tend to have a lot of frothy small flowers and leaves and no, nothing really big and bold. So I'm sort of working on getting back some um, nice big showy flowers. Um, does anybody want to talk about cut flowers? Because I realise we're out, out of time. Okay, so I think that's um, that's about it. So next next talk is really continuation. Um, what you can sow that I haven't covered in this talk, um, and all the kind of maintenance jobs, mulches, green manures, harvesting recipes. But I think really the next talk is more about your questions. So um, I'd encourage you that if you have any problems now um, and you want to talk about them and um, discuss what you can do about it um, up until, was it 18th of May? Tuesday, the 18th of May. Um, then um, just save them up and let me know. Um, and you can always ask on um, Facebook as well. I'll be trying to do some sort of edge advice on the Transition Town Wellington Facebook page.